third question, uh, we will come back to Facebook and the issue with Trevor in the end, I'm pretty sure. But how many of you use Amazon or have used Amazon? Okay, interesting. Okay, we are now moving into the logistics. So for all you Amazon buyers, uh, this is for you. <laughs> um, I'm happy to listen to a talk by Ned Rossiter. Ned is a media theorist. He's professor at the University of Western Sydney. His last book is Organized Networks, Media Theory, Creative Labor, and New Institutions from 2006. And there's a new book coming uh, this year, Mitt Routledge, and it's called Software, Infrastructure, Labor, a Media Theory of Logistical Nightmares. And we will look into one of those nightmares. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you in particular to Christopher and, and Daphne for inviting me to participate in the program. It's um, uh, a total blast. Uh, are we going to go to this slide? Yeah, it takes a moment. Can we have uh... Yay. Okay. Thank you. Logistical media determine our situation consisting of locational devices such as voice picking technology, GPS tracking, RFID tags, and biometric monitoring technologies, logistical media calibrate labor and life, objects and atmospheres. The spatial and temporal properties of these information and communication technologies are a determinant force in the production of subjectivity and economy. Their primary function is to extract value by optimizing the efficiency of living labor and supply chain operations. Anticipated in the work on logistical modernities by urban theorist and military historian Paul Virilio, and elaborated to some extent in the study on gameplay and war simulations by media philosopher Patrick Krogan, the term logistical media is named as such by communication historian and social theorist John Durham Peters. For Peters, the concept of logistical media stresses the infrastructural role of media. Logistical media as technologies, infrastructure and software coordinate, capture, and control the movement of people, finance, and things. Infrastructure makes worlds, logistics governs them. The formation of logistical media theory therefore requires an analysis of how labor is organized and governed through software interfaces and media technologies that manage what anthropologist Anna Ching identifies as supply chain capitalism. The flexibility of global supply chains and just-in-time modes of production shape who gets employed, where they work, and what sort of work they do. Logistical labor emerges at the interface between infrastructure, software protocols, and design. Labor time is real time. Logistical labor is more than a unit to be measured according to KPIs. It is the lifeblood of economy and design, exploitation and consumption. Logistical labor underpins the traffic of infrastructure and circuits of capital. The politics of infrastructure intersects with the experience and condition of logistical labor and life within urban settings. But where is the infrastructure that makes these planetary scale economies, biopolitical regimes, and social lives possible? In addition to storage, transmission, and processing systems, the study of logistical media attends to the aesthetic qualities particular or peculiar to the banality of spreadsheets, enterprise resource planning, or ERP systems, and software applications that have arisen from particular histories in military theaters, cybernetics, infrastructural design, transport, and communication. Questions of securitization, control, coordination, algorithmic architectures, protocols, and parameters are among those relevant to a theory of logistical media. With its attention to flexibility, contingency, control, and coordination, logistical media critique opens the relation between economies of data and the remodeling of labor and life. Here, the fantasy of logistical industries of creating interoperability through protocols of electronic data interchange, or EDI, and ERP software platforms hits its limits. Designed to track the movement of people and things, EDI and ERP architectures are, to, are intended to function as real-time registrations of labor productivity and efficiency of distributed systems. Yet these technologies of optimization frequently rub up against any number of disruption in the form of labor struggles, infrastructural damage, software glitches, supply chain um, uh, problems, and so forth. 
So what is supply chain software and what does it do? Why don't we have it installed on our PCs, tablets and laptops? Why are we so utterly unaware of it? The digital humanities and software studies may have something to contribute by way of response to these sort of questions, but both would radically, uh, need to radically shift their focus away from a general mission to digitize the humanities archive and conduct exotic sorties into the fringes of network cultures. These are important enough activities, but they tell us little about how capital and power works. First of all, we need to enter the imaginary world of SAP, Oracle and their kin. We need to know how the technical architectures and political economy of such enterprise systems um, work because whether we are aware of it or not, our lives are becoming increasingly subsumed by logistical nightmares. And we can think also, I think, of the way social media, Facebook, are part of something that a uh, friend and co-author Zonke Zele calls our logis logistical life streams or life stream logistics. So following on from our transit labor project, uh, Brett Nielsen, myself, our friends and collaborators have begun a new program of collective research that extends our interest in logistical operations along global lines of influence and connection marked by Chinese infrastructural expansion. Dubbed a Logistical Worlds, Infrastructure, Software and Labor, this project moves between Athens, Calcutta, Valparaiso, investigating regimes of circulation and containment that connect China's manufacturing industries to different corners of the world. Our interest is in how infrastructure and software combine as technologies of governance that coordinate and control logistical operations and labor practices, situated in select sites along the China-centered trade network known as the New Silk Road. Recalling the historical Silk Road of trade and cultural transmission that connected Asia to Europe, the geostrategic concept of the New Silk Road has emerged to register the logistical measures already been put in place by commercial entities and policymakers to meet the expected changes as Asia overtakes Europe as the world's largest trading region. At stake is the forging of new corridors that connect East Asia to Latin America and extend across the Indian subcontinent to Southern Europe, where China's state-owned shipping company, Costco, has undertaken a major infrastructural investment in Piraeus. Uh, granted as a concession by the previous, uh, we can say very joyfully, Greek government-controlled Port Authority to the Chinese state-owned company Costco in 2009, the second pier of the Port of Piraeus has become a crucial site of Chinese economic expansion in Europe. It is once a space of infrastructural investment, economic transition, and changing labor processes and relations, all of which, you know, uh, as we know, following the uh, outcome with the victory by Syriza is being brought into question, uh, I think maybe on the first or second day in power. Perez is also a political space produced not only by the dealings between states, companies, and continents, but also by the exercise of power inherent in the management science of logistics. A crucial aspect of the port's governance is vested in the infrastructural installations and logistical routines that guide its operations. The standards and software protocols surrounding the movement of shipping containers are key factors here. Approaching the concession uh, of Costco, Costco concession in this way means not only investigating its position in global measures of transport, uh, communication and software, but also understanding how it expands the frontiers of capital to facil facilitate processes of accumulation, dispossession, and exploitation. Port infrastructures, and for some reason I'm showing you everything that isn't a port, uh, we're back in India somehow um, with the um, IT towns there. Um, even though I've had five days to think of these slides, I somehow uh, got the wrong continent. <laughs> That's what happens when you go on a plane for 27 hours. So port infrastructure becomes animated not just by the movement of machines, but through patterns of data. Whether through the configuration of yard systems, the stacking sequence of containers, the oversight of customs procedures, or the calculation of labor efficiencies, the making of port spaces according to computational transactions instantiates the economic potential of algorithmic governance. It's in this sense that logistics organizes labor as an abstraction within the parameters governed by sub-software. So, uh, how does all of this tie into this panel's question of escape from technologies of capture? The problem 
with the post-digital settings of today is that we are unable to think within the box. We can speak of a politics of parameters, but ultimately this is still scientific or specific knowledge to engineers who design the architectures within which we conjure our imagination. But we can no longer harness our imagination, only click on predetermined options. What therefore might it mean to design a program of research, cultural practice and political thought that exploits the geography of data infrastructure as we know it? Indeed, how might we invent our own infrastructures? A labor theory of value provides little insight into the abstraction of algorithmic capitalism, in which value is derived from the work of the soul, but only insofar as it is rendered as data listed for trade. We don't know the extent of the labor input into the machine of algorithmic capitalism, or even if there was any labor at all within an economy of automation special to high-frequency trading, for instance. These are occasions when society is confronted by largely unintelligible cybernetic operations. As the legendary science fiction writer and theorist uh, Stanislav Lem has proposed, the designer's task will be to build a black box which performs the necessary regulation. Such work suggests a potential form of intervention into the labor process in financial tra transactions governed by algorithmic apparatuses. Yet Lem is more circumspect when it comes to complex systems such as the brain and society whose non-repeatable actions are beyond symbolic representation in the form of an algorithm and therefore elude technologies of prediction and preemption. For Lem, the algorithm is repeated twice, first by the technologist as a theory on paper and then as it manifests as a course of action in real life. The movement from algorithm to action is the work of translation from the plan into a series of material activities. The algorithm as black box is thus rendered visible as a material trace. One might then propose that all material acts can be re-engineered to reveal the black box of their making. But this would be to assume a linear process rather than a complex non-linear dynamic of feedback inherent to the concept of cybernetics. When loyalty cards proliferate in our virtual wallets, when coupon systems and location-based devices are coupled with payment apps that track our patterns of consumption, we get, uh, begin to get a sense of how shopping experiences are designed around economies of capture. To refuse is perhaps to miss out on the sweet feel of the discount, but at least we get a fleeting sense of having preserved our anonymity. Indeed, anonymity becomes, becomes a key algorithmic gesture, conceptual figure and technical mechanism through which we might begin to design a black box politics within the horizon of logistical media. For to be anonymous renders the black box inoperable. Paradoxically and tragically, the side of struggle is at once ever present and nowhere to be found. In part this is because we have yet to figure out how to comprehend the black box of algorithmic design as a site where new forms of agency mesh with the bodies in pain whose labor power has also generated a surplus of highly conventionalized images and statistics that are aggregated, multiplied, and recombined in an economy of quantification. The challenge for logistical labor today is twofold. To organize without knowledge of what is inside the boxed world of algorithms, data centers, and parametric design, and to get inside and revolutionize black box politics. Thank you very much.